taken any points of order on that matter as the matter is closed. Um, tribute to former members. Last week, the Assembly observed a normal convention to express condolences on the death of our late colleague, Francie Brawley. Now, from a distance, often public perceptions focus only on the party political differences between members. They often overlook the respect for each other, the strong working relationships and the friendships which are created while pursuing common interests on behalf of our constituencies and seconds, sections of our community. And that is why the conventions to pay respect to former colleagues exist. However, during the period when the Assembly was not sitting, a number of other former members passed away, but there was no opportunity to extend the same convention to them. Having consulted with the Business Committee last week, I want to take the opportunity to put that right today and allow the Assembly to pay its respects on the record. And today, we remember the following eight former colleagues who served in this Assembly. PJ Bradley, the SDLP MLA for South Down from 1998 to 2011, who would undoubtedly be proud that his daughter Sinead continues the legacy of the Bradley name in this Assembly. Pat Raw, the Sinn Féin MLA for Nuri and Armagh from 2003 to 2007, a former Mayor of Armagh, who I obviously knew and respected as a party colleague. Donovan McClellan, the SDLP MLA for South Antrim from 1998 to 2003, and one of the first Deputy Speakers of this Assembly. Oliver Gibson, DUP MLA for West Tyrone from 1998 to 2003, who, like Francie Brawley and Seamus Mullen, who we have lost in recent weeks, also gave significant public service as a teacher. <coughs> Reverend Robert Coulter, UUP MLA for North Antrim from 1998 to 2011, and a long-serving member of the Assembly Commission. Dr Ian Adamson, UUP MLA for East Belfast from 1998 to 2003 and former Lord Mayor of Belfast. Wilson Clyde, DUP MLA for South Antrim from 1998 to 2007, after a lifetime in the agricultural industry. And Seamus Close, the Alliance MLA for Lagan Valley from 1998 to 2007 and former Deputy Leader of the Alliance Party. We formally express our belated sympathies to their families, colleagues, friends and their parties, of course. The fact that many members here today may only recognise these names but never have met them highlights that increasingly this Assembly relies on a new generation to take it forward. However, a few of us, including myself, worked alongside almost all of them throughout their tenure in this Assembly in the early days, which were also difficult days. While I knew some of them better than others, I want to acknowledge the significant public service and sacrifice that they made toward their constituencies and our society as a whole. No matter the challenges which continue to exist, we should not overlook the problems faced in the first terms of the Assembly and the pressures it posed on those who were members at that time. I extend my personal condolences to all of the families, friends and colleagues of those who have been deceased. We therefore record our thanks for the contribution of all of these colleagues that they made to public service, to the Assembly and to our community. And I would now invite other members to add their own tributes. I first call First Minister Arlene Foster. Well, let me say, uh, Speaker, I think it's a very timely uh, matter that you should bring to us today. It's one, obviously, uh, that comes uh, all together for very obvious reasons. But I think it is important that we remember former colleagues in this way. Uh, my uh, colleagues will rise uh, to pay tribute to individual members, but uh, as First Minister and Leader of the DUP, I want to put on record my sympathy to all of the families who were bereaved during uh, the three years that we did not meet in this place. I think it is important that we recognise the service that was given at that time uh, by those members, as you have rightly said, Sometimes in difficult and challenging times, uh, we sometimes think that we are the only politicians to live through challenging times, but uh, I do very well remember uh, that first assembly and, and the way in which uh, there were many challenges uh, to be dealt with. And I particularly uh, want to pay a tribute, of course, uh, to Oliver Gibson uh, and to Wilson Clyde, who were members of my party, uh, and they served with distinction during those per that period of time and indeed pass my condolences to their families and indeed to all the families of the members that are remembered here today. Thank you. I call John O'Dowd. 
Cordia, I also welcome the opportunity to add tributes to those members who have passed away uh, since the Assembly last sat. Uh, as has been said, and it has been said quite often, but it deserves to be repeated, that public life is not always an easy life, and I admire anyone who steps forward to serve in public life, regardless of which political tradition or political background they come from or espouse to. Uh, I, I knew some of those members who passed away. Um, I would like to pay a particular tribute to Pat O'Raw, who, as you mentioned in your opening comments, was the first Sinn Féin of Armagh City. I worked along with Pat in the Assembly in a number of committees in preparing for the establishment of the Assembly uh, pre-2007. I, I think that uh, often when, when public figures lose their lives, it's, it's forgotten that there's, there's family members left behind, uh, whether it's, it's partners, husbands, wives, children, uh, etc., who, who, who grieve the person, while society grieves the public representative. I also want to pay tribute uh, to Robert Coulter, Reverend Robert Coulter, who uh, represented his constituents in a very quiet, humble way, but he, he, he made his point. I remember when I was Education Minister that he was lobbying extensively for schools in his constituency. He always did it in a very respectful way, but he made his point. I think we could learn a lot of lessons uh, from how uh, Reverend Coulter went about his business. So to all those uh, who have lost their lives since the last sitting of the Assembly, to all their family members, and, and I think of Sinead as well, when we pay tribute to PJ, who I also worked with, and also knew uh, as well, um, that uh, we pay tribute to them uh, and honour their memories at this time. Thank you. I call Nicola Mallon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I begin by thanking you for creating the space for us today to reflect on the contribution of former members who have passed away over the last three years. On behalf of the SDLP, I want to express my sincere condolences to the families of all those who served their communities here and to the current members who served with them in difficult times. While we often disagree in this assembly, I think it is fair to say that more often than not, Political battles rarely infect the, the personal relationships that have been built across our parties and across our communities. The strength of this place should be our ability to respectfully differ, but never stop working together in the substantial common interests of those we represent. And I think that that's a thread that connects the contributions of all those across all parties who we are remembering today. I would like to pay particular tribute to those SDLP voices who are no longer with us. If you were looking for inspiration on how to connect with your community and represent its interests, you need look no further than PJ Bradley. A fierce and compassionate advocate for Burren, Warren Point and Bally Holland, PJ's loyalty was to the people of South Down before anyone else. That spoke to his values and his character. PJ was a patriot in the truest sense of the word, working quietly without fanfare to bring our communities together and build a resilient peace. He was a trailblazer in initiating the campaign for Narrow Water Bridge, a campaign his daughter Sinead has taken up with the same vigour. I know how proud he was when Sinead won a seat in South Down, and I have no doubt that the moment the votes were tallied, he was already thinking about the next campaign. Their contribution to our party, to South Down and to Ireland has been immense. Can I also reflect, Mr Speaker, on the contribution that Donovan McClelland made to peace and politics on this island? As an SDLP delegate to the Brooke Mayhew Talks and as a participant in the Good Friday negotiations, Donovan was an important member of our negotiating team and was a key part of that immense effort to get an agreement over the line in 1998. He then worked to sustain these institutions as Deputy Speaker, winning respect for his unfailing fairness to all members. But it is impossible to reflect on Donovan's life without mentioning the lasting legacy of love he had for his family. I have the privilege of working with Donovan's wife, Noreen, one of the North's most genuinely caring public representatives. Her support for him during peace talks and her work since has created a lasting legacy that they both share as pillars of our peace. Life, Mr Speaker, in politics is never easy, not least for our family members, who in many ways have to share us with our constituents. 
and it can be difficult for them as their husband, wives, fathers, mothers all work long hours. As we know, being an elected representative isn't a nine-to-five job. But at the same time, it is with great pride that they see their loved ones battling tirelessly and serving relentlessly their constituents as they strive to make life better for their own children and for all children across Northern Ireland. I have no doubt that the families of PJ Bradley, Donovan McClelland, Seamus Close, Dr Ian Adamson, Pat O'Raw, the Reverend Robert Coulter, Oliver Gibson and Wilson Clyde are all filled with immense pride at the contribution and legacy they each made to making this place of ours that much better. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, and I call Steve Egan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And uh, like the rest of the members of the Ulster Unionist Party, I'd like to rise and pay tribute to all of our members, but in particular to the Reverend Robert Coulter and Dr <coughs> Ian Adamson. Uh, the Reverend Coulter was a man of faith who served in this assembly from just before its formation in 1996 when he was elected to the Northern Ireland Forum for Political Dialogue, where he served as the UUP Chief Whip. He had a long political career. In 1985, Robert was elected as a UUP councillor to Ballymena Borough Council. He retained his seat in 1989 and in 1993 was re-elected to the council and also elected as the first UUP mayor of Ballymena since the early 1970s. And he served as first citizen of Ballymena from 1993 to 96. He was part of the team in the background that led the negotiation foundations for what was to become the Belfast Agreement in 1998. And he was elected as the North Antrim Assembly member in 1998, a seat he was to hold until his retirement in 2011. During his entire Assembly career, he was a member of the Assembly Commission. He was also active in the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association which saw him represent the Assembly at conferences in India, Australia and Canada. In the Assembly, he also served on the Health Committees and Employment and Learning Committees and was our party spokesman on both portfolios during his times on both these committees. In 2010, he was awarded an MBE for his services to the Commission and to the Assembly. Following his retirement in 2011, he had cha championed the cause of special needs education and something very dear to his heart, he served as a chaplain to the Ulster Defence Regiment Association and was president of the Mid Antrim branch of the Ulster Special Constabulary Association. The Reverend Dr. Coulter passed away on September 5, 2018, after a long battle with cancer. We remember him very fondly and we pass on his prayers and his good wishes to his surviving family. Dr. Ian Adamson was a former Ulster Unionist Party Lord Mayor of Belfast who died in Belfast earlier on. He was a man of many talents and interests. He represented the Victoria electoralist area of Belfast City Council from 1989 to 2011 and served as Lord Mayor, Deputy Lord Mayor and High Sheriff. He was also the MLA for East Belfast between 1998 and 2003 and was a founder member of the Somme Association. In addition to his political career, he was a medical doctor and a keen interest and provided a wealth of knowledge in the field of history particularly local history and Ulster Scots, and was the author, as many of us can testify, to numerous books and papers. He made a huge contribution to cultural and political life and will be greatly missed by all his parties within the party, the friends within the party. Indeed, Lord MP, who had served with Dr Adamson in both City Hall and Stormont, said he had a great sense of humour and dry wit. His flair for cultural issues, particularly as they applied to the Ulster Scots tradition, were brought to life with his lectures and anecdotes. Those of us who were colleagues in the City Hall and in the Assembly will miss him greatly. Indeed, he will probably be looking down now with amusement, says that during one sort of time during the Assembly, he made a short contribution in Welsh. And a member from the party from Sinn Féin congratulated him on his fluency in Irish. Adamson corrected him. It was that most ancient of British languages, Welsh, he said. He has served, he survived by his family, and we wish him and his family all the best wishes. But thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And I call Naomi Long. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, it feels very strange to be making these tributes to colleagues in this way, but I'm genuinely grateful for the opportunity to be able to do so. I hope that members of other parties will forgive me for focusing on my late colleague Seamus Close in my remarks today. 
He was one of the first people to join Alliance when it was first formed in 1970, driven by his belief that the horror which was unfolding on our streets needed to stop and that Northern Ireland needed to change. Characteristically, he didn't sit back and wait for someone else to do the heavy lifting, but he rolled up his sleeves and he did it himself. In 1973, he was first elected to the new Lisburn Borough Council, and between his role there and as an MLA, served um, as an Alliance elected representative for over 34 years. One of the highlights of that time for him was in 1993, when he became the first Catholic and non-unionist Lord Mayor, or Mayor um, of Lisburn uh, Council. His first act on that occasion was to write to the leaders of all the local churches and ask if he could attend worship with them. I think a measure of how he tried to instill respect at the heart of everything he did. He was always willing to share his advice and his experience with others, often whether we wanted it or not, and his views uh, with, with other younger councillors and politicians. That advice that you could have it out in the chamber, you could have hot and heavy arguments, but that if you couldn't go outside and shake hands and still be friends at the end of it, then you were in the wrong job, I think is good advice for all of us in this chamber too. Seamus was very much a conviction politician. It showed in his courageous stand on paramilitarism, on his unswerving commitment to creating a shared future. And he was an inspiring person to work with, to listen to, um, and to be part of the team of which he was. His style was direct and blunt, something which I personally like, and he never pulled his punches with anyone, not even his party colleagues. That style led to him being not just respected, but actually a very useful negotiator in that people knew where they stood and knew that he could be relied upon to still be standing there when they returned to him later. Um, and they were able to rely on him to be honest and forthright with his opinions. However, that directness was also laced um, with a wit and a humour which made him not just respected but also much liked. It also meant that post his retirement he made the transition to commentator on politics seamlessly, aided hugely by his independence of thought, having shared a studio with him on occasion in his role as commentator. I certainly never took it for granted that Seamus would agree with me and always felt very relieved on the occasions when he did. I have no doubt that those of you who also shared um, a studio with him will have felt the same relief. In the Assembly, his training in business came to the fore, um, particularly in finance, and his desire to know that public money was not misspent made him a passionate advocate on the Public Accounts Committee, always ready to challenge where he felt that there was waste, where he felt that money could be better spent, um, always conscious that it came from someone else's pocket and should be taken care of properly. But while he was a formidable debater, a fierce opponent and a fearless defender of democracy, he was at heart a family man. It is fitting that his wife Deirdre has been able to join us today. And so to her, to Natasha, Stephen, Brian and Christopher and to his grandchildren, I want to extend our ongoing thoughts and prayers at this time. I never had the pleasure of being in this chamber with him. But we were part of the same assembly team during the hiatus in proceedings between 2003 and 2007, and it was an honour to be so. He was always an encourager to me. He encouraged me not to mince my words, to be direct um, and to be truthful in what I said. Um, some of you may wish that I had taken his advice less to heart than perhaps I have, but he was larger than life. He was full of good humour and a generous spirit, and he's very much missed by all of us who knew him. And I call Tom Buchanan. Mr. Speaker, of course, good to take time this morning to remember uh, and to reflect on those who used to serve in this house, who sat on some of these benches and who made their contribution to society and also to the constituency in which they served. And sadly, today they're no longer with us. And for a number of these people, they were in this house when I came in in 2003 and had the privilege of serving alongside uh, some of them. And of course, we will all remember them in their different ways for the different contributions they made and for the service that they provided to their own uh, constituencies. As for me, I suppose I remember fondly and with fondness my dear friend and colleague Oliver Gibson. And Oliver was the person who brought me into politics at the very 
at the very outset, brought me into council, and then paved the way for me to come on after him and follow him into the assembly here in 2003. Oliver was someone who lived for politics, and he made some very valuable contributions indeed. And he delivered for his constituents. He was a former uh, school teacher, vice principal in Oma High School, and he was very passionate about education and very passionate about delivering for his people in West Tyrone. Of course, he was also uh, a member of the Ulster Defence Regiment, and there he was someone who was very um, uh, wanted to make sure that law and order was protected for the people of uh, Northern Ireland. And Oliver did make some very, very good contributions and, and deliveries for the people in West Tyrone, which still stand today as a testimony for him. And whenever you, you go throughout the lengths and breadths of West Tyrone, people are still talking passionately about Oliver Gibson and about the legacy that he left and the testimony that there is for him. And so today, as we come to remember uh, the respective families that have been left with that vacant chair, with that silent voice in the home, as they uh, come and, and seek to learn to live with the loss that they have sustained, I want to uh, simply pass on our deepest and our heartfelt sympathy to all of the families all of the respective families involved and, and, and trust and pray that they will know God's help and blessing uh, in the days that lie ahead. It's always difficult whenever a loved one that you love so dearly is taken from us by death. And therefore, it's not something that you get over, but it's something that you learn to live with. And as the families learn to live with their grief and their sorrow and their loss, then we want to assure them of our prayers. And for you and I today in the chamber then, it behoves each one of us to number our days and to apply our hearts unto wisdom. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And I call Liz Kimmins. And Corla, um, just to echo the comments of, of the other members here in relation to uh, former members who have passed away during the last three years, I just wish to pay tribute to Pat O'Raw. Um, a former MLA for the same constituency that I now represent in Uri Armagh, and to thank Pat for her service to the constituents of this area during her time here in the Assembly, but also in um, Armagh City and District Council, where she was the first Sinn Féin Mayor. Gormagat. I now call Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, firstly, could I use this opportunity to offer my condolences to my friend and colleague, Pat Catney, who today lays his mother Eileen to rest, and I'd like to extend that to his siblings Elizabeth, Lawrence, Jim, Dipna, Damien, Assumpta and Rosanza. Um, I would also like to add my belated words of sympathy to all those families of former members who have been rightly remembered here today, and I would like to welcome Noreen McClelland to the public gallery, the wife of former member Donovan McClelland. It's at times like this that all our differences, whether real or merely perceived, vanish. I, as PJ Bradley's daughter and as an elected rep of this House, find myself in this most unusual and highly privileged position of being able to stand and thank each of you for your kind words of expression of condolences offered to myself and my fam family following our loss. The sheer volume of kind words of condolences extended to us, often coupled with the sharing of personal stories that beautifully captured Daddy's kindness, have been overwhelming and most comforting. To each of those individuals who reached out to comfort us from near and far, we are truly grateful. <coughs> During his lifetime before and after politics, PJ, or Daddy, as he was known in our house, held one rule above all others, his respect for human life was paramount and his commitment, commitment to peace unwavering. During his lifetime in this chamber, Daddy's love for Ireland and its people was repeatedly displayed. His tireless work on the delivery of Irish passport services to post offices here, realising his vision for all-island all free travel, whilst also reaching out to the undocumented Irish abroad, were just some of the projects he pursued with passion. Daddy also enjoyed immensely representing all the people of South Down and his time on the Agricultural Committee. He did so with great humility, diligence and respect for all. It's my opinion, however, that on local issues it brought him the greatest sense of achievement. 
projects such as securing a village green in our parish in Burn and placing in it a Millennium Wall that records the names of every person living in the parish on Millennium Day marks some of his local legacy. An avid GAA supporter who never missed an All-Ireland football final and lifelong member of St Mary's GAC, it would not be possible for me to even begin putting on record the vast range of achievements Daddy accomplished in his lifetime. But thankfully for me, much of that has been captured in the books he published before his passing. Of course, any work unfinished has been passed to me and others minister for completion. So absolutely no pressure on delivering that narrow water bridge. <laughs> so Mr. Speaker, on behalf of my mother, Leontia, my siblings, Martin, Joanne, Deborah, Catherine, Stephanie, William and Michal, Daddy's brother, Liam, and sisters, Nora and Nula, and all our extended families, I wish to thank this house and all of those who offered words of comfort to us. So many people stepped in to help us, and I am acutely aware that in naming some people, I will leave others out. However, I cannot let this moment pass without personally thanking Father Charlie Byrne, Roisin McCrink, my office staff, Sean O'Hare and the McAteer family, who offered us great support at a very difficult time. Finally, Mr Speaker, I would like to also use the opportunity to place on record our huge appreciation to the medical team who supported Daddy during his short illness and the Southern Area Hospice who supported Daddy and our family during what was a very peaceful passing. I will always be proud to be PJ's daughter. Rest in peace, Daddy. Uh, thank you. And I call Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and can I thank you for allowing this piece of business to proceed today. Um, like other members, I want to pay tribute to those members who have passed away, but in particular uh, to the Reverend Dr Bob Coulter, who was a, a personal friend and mentor to me. And I think as John O'Dowd and our party leader has already expressed, Bob's passion for health and employment and learning matters in this place is something that he, he held deeply and it was that experience that he used where he actually brought to bear about the delivery of Castle Tower Special School in Ballymena. And many will see that as part of his enduring legacy as he was chair of the Board of Governors from the original concept to the actually delivery of the school and, he knew, and I know that he didn't make John's job as Education Minister easy at times but it was the way he conducted that business in that campaign that brought about the delivery of that school. It has been noted that during his time in Stormont, it wasn't just the ease with which he moved around the corridors, but it was also the speed, because he often left many a staff member or visit, visitor finding it hard to keep up with him. And of the tributes that have been paid, everyone has acknowledged his warmth and the personal time he gave to anyone he met. He was a man who was as comfortable sitting at a kitchen table up a lane in Clough or sitting down to tea with Nelson Mandela. And I am blessed, like many, to have learned from Bob's experience. And having had him as a political mentor and guide has been a, a great res resource to me. Because a mentor is someone who wants to see you rise to the top and is willing to help you get there, even if it means letting you stand on their shoulders. And Bob wouldn't mind me saying that even with him on my shoulders or he and mine, there's many a hedge or a wall in North Antrim neither of the two of us could have sawn over. <laughs> he was a man, like many of you who knew him, uh, he was a man who had a story for every occasion and eventuality. And it was only at the end of those stories that you could tell by the glint in his eye whether, whether he'd actually been winding you up or not. I once said to him that he taught me everything I knew of the craft of politics. His answer to me with that same smile was, yes, but I didn't teach you everything I know. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, unfortunately, Elizabeth, Bob's wife, constant companion, companion confident and advisor, passed away only a few weeks ago as well. So I want to pass on my condolences and our condolences to comfort John, Liz, Sharon, Nick, Dan and Adam and the wider family circle. And it's in that sentiment that it was known that Bob was a man of great faith 
and his love for the Lord. And it's with his greatest strength and the gift to us all that is in that assurance that we know that he is walking the corridors of power in a better place with the same ease and grace and welcome that he walked the corridors here in Stormy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay, thank you. And I call Trevor Lunn. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I would like to pay tribute to all the members that you mentioned at the start of this proceedings. Um, I can't say it. I knew them all very well, but I, I do remember PJ Bradley as an absolute gentleman. A pleasure to be with. And also, the Reverend Robert Coulter, I would say exactly the same thing. He was a, a true gentleman and made some great contributions to this house. Oddly enough, I also remember Oliver Gibson. I actually know him from before he ever got into politics, back in the 70s. Another gentleman, but I only knew him through education, so I'm not saying about his politics. The, I particularly want to carry on from what Naomi said about Seamus Close, and also say a few brief words about uh, Dr. Ian Adamson. Uh, Seamus Close was the reason I joined the Lance back in 1989. Uh, I'm not going to repeat what Naomi said about him, but just to amplify it slightly, he was awarded the OBE in 1997 for services to, for, for his contribution to public services. And uh, he was awarded the Freedom of the City of Lisburn, Freedom of the City of Lisburn in 2010, along with actually Ivan, Ivan Davis, who was a past deputy speaker here, and also um, Evan Poots, his father, Charlie Poots, they all achieved the freedom of the city on the same day, all richly deserved. Seamus had many uh, strings to his bow. He, he was, for instance, a prison visitor at the Mays Prison for some time, and his concern for the welfare of prisoners and uh, staff was very evident at times. But he also is quite capable of demonstrating a sense of humour because um, if you might remember, there was the occasion when a tunnel was discovered under the, under the fence at the maze. And Seamus stood up at Lisburn Council and speculated that he wasn't too sure if it was people trying to get in or people trying to get out because of the benevolent regime that was the public perception of what went on in the maze at that time. He, uh, he was indeed the first non-unionist uh, mayor of, of Lisburn. But he even made a joke about that. He said he was the first one ever that had a beard. And uh, that was that was Seamus, you know. He was a very, very gifted debater in this assembly and in council. He actually did 38 years on council, on broken service. I mean, that's more than half a lifetime. I don't know how he could stick it, but he did. <laughs> but, uh, and fair play to him. And he, he was a massive contributor to the affairs of Lisburn and the Lisburn Council. He was uh, following the Good Friday Agreement in 1998, in which election he actually topped the poll in Lisburn, which is fairly unusual for an Alliance person, but there he did indeed. And he was tipped at that time to assume your job, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it didn't happen for him, but I do know because he was sitting in my house when he received the calls that he was offered the job by the Northern Ireland Office Minister and indicated he would accept it. But it didn't happen for him. We actually heard on the news later that night that somebody else was to take the post. He held very, very firm views on matters which, which sometimes uh, diverged slightly from party policy. But, you know, there but for the grace of God go we all. And uh, <laughs> the re redesignation, if you remember, back in the 80s, when the Alliance Party decided to redesignate the unionists for a day. Well, they all did. I wasn't here, except for Seamus. Seamus was having none of this. He didn't, didn't believe in it at all. And also, there was things that some of the social issues of the day where he did have trouble with them. Uh, I'm not going to that, but um, he stuck to his beliefs always. And one thing about him, he always knew where you stood with him, because he would tell you, and he would tell you straight out. <laughs> and that, that applied to his friends as well as his so called foes. But he had no foes outside the chamber. He just didn't. His attitude would leave it in the chamber, no matter what was said or how vitriolic it got. You could have a cup of tea with Seamus after, or even to be brandy if you really wanted it. I want to talk about him just briefly as the family man. He was, he was married to Jadri, who's behind me here today, for around 40 years. 
the four lovely children, Christopher, Brian, Stephen, and of course, uh, Natasha. Now, when I first got to know him, around 1990, Natasha was very ill, as most of you probably remember. She was suffering from a childhood leukemia, and that was an illness which, which didn't, didn't spare many children. In fact, I think the survival rate was about one in five at the time. But N Natasha survived, and uh, she is now in her early 30s, a lovely young lady, and has been blessed with a, a son two or three years ago, which again was in, would have been in some doubt at, at the time because of what happened to her during her childhood. The, she was just he, he delighted in his family. He was the ultimate family man. Well, he, he could, could be quite scathing in terms of his, his behaviour here and through politics. His attitude in the family was completely different. I know his son, Brian, who may be up there as well, uh, referred to him as a big softy. Uh, I think that's going a bit far, but he was, uh, he was certainly a lovely family man, and he took great pleasure in, in the family, and also now in his grand, grandchildren. He has three, there's Rory, Thomas and Emily. As a, as a family, we shared some very good times with Deirdre and Seamus uh, on weekends, holidays, over the years. Came to be very, very good friends, and uh, we will miss him, as will all of his colleagues in his family, wide family circle, all of his friends in Lisbon, and his friends here as well. But we do have his legacy, Mr. Speaker, as a as an alliance representative, as a prominent politician, and as a supreme family man. That's the way I'd like to remember him. If I could just turn very briefly to Ian Adamson, um, who I didn't actually know very well either, but um, I did admire his language skills and his intellect. And uh, uh, Gallery, he knew maybe about a dozen different languages fluently, including some, I think, some of us had never heard of because they were very, very old languages, but he knew about the, the history of language. And he could be very severe on our Irish-speaking colleagues because he thought that the Irish, sometimes that they were speaking, wasn't true Irish because they hadn't gone back 5,000 years to find the, the derivation of it. Um, he also, he didn't particularly favour the Alliance Party, to be honest, um, especially in his later years. He could be quite severe with us, but... Um, <coughs> That's, 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 <laughs> but that's, that's politics, Mr. Speaker. He was a decent man, and we miss him just the same. My, my abiding memory of him, I'll finish with this, Mr. Speaker, is that um, I, I did the trip to the Psalm battlefields with the Psalm Association a few years ago, and the Ian, who was a founder member of that association, actually was our guide for the time we were there. And what he did was he, he sat at the front of the bus and in between every stop he told us exactly where we'd been, the history of it, where we're going, the history of it, and probably what was coming up next. He was an absolute fund of knowledge about the battlefields, about the First World War, and about the particular details of the psalm. So I'd like to express my sympathy to everybody who was mentioned today, particularly to Ian's family and of course to Seamus and the family. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I call Paul, Palm Cameron. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and can I thank you for the opportunity to uh, pay these tributes to uh, the, the many members who have um, passed away in the last three years while this um, place has not been sitting. Um, I'd, I'll be very brief and just want to mention in particular um, Wilson Clyde, who was uh, MLA for South Antrim, and certainly he was. Uh, uh, part of my beginnings uh, within the political, uh, my political time with this party in the DUP. And uh, Wilson was a bit of a character, uh, a farmer. He was a, a very proud unionist and uh, he was incredibly loyal in, in every way and that was in a very personal sense as well. Um, I had the pleasure of working for him in his constituency office for a few years back in the 2000s and um, he, he always turned up with a, a smile on his face and always ready to crack some really crummy joke. Um, and uh, he was very notorious for that. But he was an incredibly honest gentleman, very loyal in his character, and very much a family man. 
and I know he'll be very much missed by his wife, Evelyn, and the entire family circle um, in the Ramblestown, Southampton area. So thank you for the opportunity for uh, giving us this opportunity to pay tribute to the past members today. Thank you. Thank you. And I call John Dallet. Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm probably almost in the unique position that I knew all of these uh, members uh, for my long service in this place. Obviously, I knew some of them better than others. My two uh, party colleagues, Donovan McClelland and PG Bradley, I knew in particular, but there were others as well through serving on committees. Donovan McClelland was a lecturer in the University of Ulster. Life could have been very comfortable for him, but he didn't choose that. He contributed to the peace process that eventually became the Good Friday uh, Agreement. And in doing that, he brought himself uh, danger. And I remember being in his home on several occasions, fortified with high fences, bulletproof glass, and deadlocks, and all sorts of things. But that was the contribution he made, which has brought us today uh, to where we are. And of course, you cannot mention Donovan without his wife, Noreen, who parallel served in an adjacent uh, council and uh, today makes a huge contribution. And if I had one wish, it would be that one day she would join uh, this assembly. Mr Speaker, this is of particular interest to yourself. Donovan, as you know, was a deputy speaker, and he was a man of severe discipline. He didn't suffer fools uh, easily. And on one particular occasion, there was a member who was particularly troublesome uh, in the morning. Now, I reassure uh, existing parties that it was none of their members. But in the afternoon, Donovan was in the seat you're sitting in now, and within 30 seconds, he was ejected. I'm not sure if he did it according to rules, but he'd had enough of him, and he got the message. Uh, P.J. Bradley, I served alongside on the Agricultural Committee, but I also was lobbied many times by him for the undocumented in America, and I'm glad that Sinead has mentioned that, because that was important to a lot of people. Uh, Donovan's contribution and P.J. Bradley's contribution were invaluable. I know that members of the Alliance Party and others have spoken uh, about Seamus Close, and I'm very conscious that his wife, dear, is here today. Seamus Close was an amazing individual, and I had the pleasure of serving on the uh, Public Accounts Committee with him, and he quickly became known as the Rock Rockweiler, not because he went around biting ankles or things like that, but because of the way he penetrated uh, bad practice in government departments. And I know that Seamus and other retired members of the Public Accounts Committee met for years after he retired to reminisce and to talk about the good old days uh, when uh, they sorted out the financial difficulties uh, of this assembly. Seamus will be sadly missed and I uh, wish to record my experience of working with him, particularly in the Public Accounts Committee. I know others uh, will, uh, the other members I equally appreciate it, but I couldn't uh, resume my seat without making reference to the Reverend Robert Coulter, or Bob, as he allowed me uh, to call him. He was an incredible person who had a vision for the future of this assembly which went far beyond simply winning the next election. In closing, I neglected to say, when I was speaking about uh, Donovan McClellan's difficult life, I'm so sorry that in recent days our First Minister and Deputy First Minister have received threats. That was the type of life that Donovan McClellan lived under in Randallstown those years ago. And current members of this assembly should never forget there were a lot of people who went before you, who made huge sacrifices, took enormous risks to bring this place to where it is today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. And I call Trevor Clark. 
very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, can I thank you for the opportunity today to reflect on those members who have passed um, during the time that this assembly didn't sit. Um, as all the members have referred to their own colleagues, I, I want to refer in particular to my two party colleagues, that the name of Oliver Gibson and Wilson Clyde, who has already been described as a proud unionist. And I want to echo those comments because Wilson was a very proud unionist in terms of his roots. Um, Wilson Clyde, being from Southampton, and both him and I shared the same townland of Grogan, um, Wilson would have been one of the biggest encouragements uh, for me to actually put my name forward first in 2005. Um, whenever I was a young boy, Wilson's name was in the ballot paper and I was unable to vote for him. So Wilson had been about for a long time, over 20 years in local government and then from 1998 to 2007 in this assembly. Behind all of that, um, as Pam has, or sorry, my colleague from Southampton has described in terms of that nature of Wilson, Wilson was also a family man uh, and a farmer and he spent much of his life building the farm that he had. But behind all of that, he was a community man and he wanted to see the community thrive and he worked to do that within his community. Um, I want to pay tribute to Wilson and pay um, my sympathies to his wife, Evelyn, who, who um, ha Wilson has left. Wilson was a very active member of the party right up until his poor health. So a man who served in his uh, early 80s was still a very active member of our party who was frequently seen at meetings he was so loyal, he was probably one of the first ones to be seen there and one of the last ones to leave. And I think that's maybe because, as my colleague said, he was still telling those silly jokes at the end. But Wilson was there and he was very dependable. And I want to pay tribute to him for that and for what he has done for the people of Southampton. Thank you. And I call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I just want to place on uh, record my thanks to you for facilitating this uh, very moving tribute to the former members of this House. And you couldn't sit here and not be moved by some of the remarks that have been made by former members who perhaps operated in much more difficult, turbulent times than we find ourselves in. And, and, and I would, I, I'm sure we could note that we could certainly do a lot better in the future, learning from some of the instances of the past. And, and before I, I, I talk on two particular members, I did want to pay tribute uh, to Sinead Bradley for speaking so passionately about her father. So most probably the most difficult uh, tribute today has been by Sinead so, uh, that was fitting for your father and, and for the other member from Lagan Valley, Pat Catney, who is Brian's his mother, I'd like to put on uh, uh, record our regards at this difficult time for him. I'm one of those new members, um, not that young, but didn't get the, the, the privilege and the chance to work with any of those people that we have spoken of today. However, I did have a chance to know two of them in two different uh, formats, the Reverend Bob Coulter. Um, I knew through his, his family, and certainly the legacy that he leaves, not only in his family, which is a credit to him, but is also uh, the, the member from uh, North Antrim, I would say, is, is sitting here today to, down to the guidance of uh, Bob, and, and, and we'll be forever grateful for that. But I'm, I'm minded uh, to, to pass on my personal respect for Seamus Close. Um, Seamus was one of those politicians in Lisburn when I wasn't interested in politics that I certainly may not have shared absolutely everything that he aspired to, but I can tell you hand on heart I respected everything he stood for because he was able to politic in a very mature way. Um, I, I would also have known Seamus, and, and he wouldn't have known this at the time, but his wife Deirdre shopped in the butchers where I worked. So I, I do know that in, in, ter in terms of those connections that we don't even know that we have with people, that I knew of him through my uh, admiration of him and through his wife, Deirdre. But just to close, Mr. Speaker, uh, the real reason for rising is that um, I think the only time that I spoke to, to, to Seamus was about six months ago. And he was uh, having a, a, a meal with his wife and another couple in Hillsborough. And we did stop. He sort of stopped me because he knew who I was and I stopped him. And we talked for five minutes and we made a commitment that we would meet for coffee. And I really look forward to meeting Seamus for coffee. And the reality is that that coffee never happened. So I would just uh, urge the Chamber to keep short accounts. If you have an appointment to make and you have someone that you need to meet up with, make it, put it in your diary, guys, and, and make sure it happens. Because, uh, like many, I won't get that chance uh, to have coffee with Seamus. Thank you. OK, thank you. And I call Robin Newton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank you for making the time available uh, to carry out these uh, tributes today? Uh, some of obviously perhaps more uh, personal uh, than, than some others. Um, 
I do want to acknowledge what has already been said by my colleagues about Oliver Gibson and Wilson Clyde, two men who one had to respect. But I would, and I hope the Ulster Unionist Party will, will forgive me for this, I won't mind this, but I would like to pay tribute to Dr Ian Adamson, who I regarded, and I know I'm sure you, Mr Speaker, uh, I regarded Ian as a personal friend, um, and we served uh, for many years in Belfast City Council uh, together, where he earned the respect uh, across the chamber uh, for his uh, abilities uh, to communicate, and indeed to communicate in a very effective, but a very poignant and indeed very jocular way, uh, as has been already mentioned. Ian, as a person, was a man of uh, great distinction, uh, a great historian, author of many books, uh, a man of great intellect uh, in the terms of his research work, and, as already been mentioned, uh, a man who spoke uh, many languages. Yet he was a man who was extremely humble, who could walk comfortably in the presence of kings, but also walk comfortably in the presence of the most humble uh, in, in society. He had this ability to cross the chamber and, and be friends, but yet he was indeed a strong unionist, a unionist with a capital U, and that never at any stage did he uh, forsake those unionist pr principles. But he had this ability, as I said, to walk with the Most High, but his ability to also drill down right into matters affecting the community that we both served in the east of the city, um, and indeed to, to be at meetings with Ian um, was indeed a privilege uh, and a good, for myself, a good learning experience. Ian was interested in the Ulster Scots, not just the Ulster Scots language, but indeed the Ulster Scots life and the Ulster Scots times, and was a strong promoter uh, of that. His sad passing came, um, and, and it came, I think many of us knew that Ian was ill, but indeed his passing came quicker than, than had been uh, anticipated. And Mr Speaker, when it is your time, and when a village uh, to hold the funeral is sealed off, and when the President of the Republic of Ireland makes the journey to that funeral, and when during the uh, entry of the, the, the uh, remains to the church, the respect and the silence that is there, and indeed as the funeral procession takes place, when there are 17 <coughs> lifts of the funeral coffin, indeed you know that someone special has passed. I'd like to extend my sympathy to Kerry, and many of you know Ian married late in life, but to Kerry, his wife, and indeed to his wider family. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, and that concludes uh, the tributes to former members who have passed away during the past three years while this Assembly was not sitting. I would like to also now take uh, the opportunity on behalf of members of this Assembly to extend all of our condolences to our colleague Pat Catney on the sad passing of his mother Eileen. Matter of the day, the, this relates to the death of Mr Harry Gregg, OBE. Claire Sugden has been given leave to make a statement on the death of Mr Harry Gregg, OBE, which fulfils the criteria set out in Standing Order 24. If other members wish to be called, they should do so by rising in their places and continuing to do so. All members